grandfather has been passed away for several years now. Cole's grandfather had a beautiful hunting knife that he passed down to Cole's dad, and I, I, I'm thinking Cole will inherit it, but it's, it's a beautiful piece, and while they love the knife, they don't want to keep using it. It's a good hunting knife, but they don't want to keep using it and wearing it away and, and risk losing it or damaging it because it's such a, a heirloom piece. It's really sent a lot of sentimental value, of course. So what they want from me is to build something very similar, a close replica of that knife, so they can carry in commemoration of the grandfather while keeping the grandfather's knife safely tucked away. So it's kind of like a, an homage to grandpa's knife. So that's what we're going to build today. I have a rough design drawn up here. As you can see we've matched the uh, the blade shape almost perfectly. You kind of got to have a bit of imagination or know what's going on inside the handle because it's a leather stack of course and we're not going to do all the slips of brass. That would take a lot of time and increase the price so the, the client didn't want to do that. But we're going to do lovely leather stack. I'm also going to try design back here on the end of the tang that I haven't done before, but it's how the knife was originally assembled. I've already cut out that rough billet. This is 01 tool steel. This is what I love to work with. So we're going to take this to the grinder now, start shaping this in. Get everything, get that tang nice and parallel. You can see it's wonky there now. The blade shape dialed in. We can grind our bevels and everything. This is going to be a fun one. Now this cut right here is exactly the reason I got this meal, or the, the primary reason, the making of guards. This would have been pretty complex before. We have to do an eight inch wide groove cut through here that a tang can slip through. And before that would have been a bunch of eighth inch holes. And of course your bit tries to draw into the next one. So you can only get them so close together and getting them in a perfect line and not wavering, which gets you outside your eighth, it's very difficult. So you end up taking a lot of time. Of course, once you punch those holes, then you have to file through to the next one with a little small file. You guys have seen me do that many times on this channel. Now we can do it in one operation and you'll see just, just how beautiful this is. Now, this is a mill vise. It's a calibrated vise, so the jaws come uh, fit perfectly together, very precise. It has these long form jaws on tracks, so they don't really skew much like a drill press vise or something, where those skew up and down. Right here, we have what are called parallels, and this is a perfectly calibrated set of exact dimension pieces of steel. So I can set a piece like this, and we're still perfectly level in plane with the vise, which should be in plane with the table, which should be in plane with your machine, etc. It just it allows you to be precise across multiple different components. So we'll lock that down now. This is very secure. Let's chuck up our cutter. Now today, for the first time, we're going to use one of these gorgeous little carbide 1 8 cutters, which I bought specifically for my knife making, and I've only played with one at this point because I just haven't had a guard to make since I've got them, but now they're going to come into use. Now the way a mill holds on to your cutters, and there are different types, but this is an R8 collet. You can see it's threaded here as a keyway, so the keyway lines up with this right here and ensures it goes in the right place in in the bore here in the machine. We're threaded in here and there is a draw bore, a rod, that runs down through the machine and when that threads in here it draws this up into the machine. You can see we have slots here so as it's being drawn up, notice this cone shape, it draws this in tight on the machine and tight on a cutter like this. Here we 
dough plunge cut. But it will side cut beautifully. And look at that, perfect 1 8 inch channel. Now we have a square tang here, so we have to square everything up and prepare, or round everything off, sorry, just fit up this block. And then we'll grind the block to shape after. King Canada has been bringing quality machinery, tools, and equipment to the North American market for over 38 years. They offer innovative products for all applications, for the industrial and commercial setting, as well as the homeowner and hobbyist. King Canada is a sponsor of the Newfoundland Hobbyist. And now we're beginning one of the more intricate parts of this build, and that is the pummel, or the rear of the handle. We're gonna do that in a very interesting way. You notice I've cut the tang down to a 1 8 inch round protrusion, and I'm tapping that right now. I'm cutting threads into that little tang protrusion, as you can see right here. Now I'm using some quarter inch brass to drill an 8 inch hole a little bit different than an eighth inch hole, but that's what we're going to use to tap to those threads. I found a little bolt to screw into the threads on the piece brass. Now that piece of brass is faceted. We want it nice and round, so I also took a piece of scrap tool steel, ground a chisel edge on it, and clamped it in my vise, as you can see here. Now I can chuck the piece of brass in and I can use my vertical mill like a lathe. Look at that. I've used this operation a couple different times now and it just works really well. That hardened tool steel on things like brass and aluminum just works beautifully. You don't dull it up at all. And like I said, you can use your vertical mill like a lathe and it is just very nice. You get accurate results, you get beautiful results, and how much fun is that just to watch. Now that brass nut we just created will be used to hold on an aluminum pummel, and that's what was used on the original knife that we have the pictures of. So I'm just cutting a half inch diameter hole with a flat bottom here now. We'll take the eighth inch center out of that as well so it can sit over the threaded tang that, we've, that we have on the knife. Also cut a shallow eighth inch slot here that can sit over the shoulders of our tang so the pummel doesn't rotate on its axis. And now I'm sure you can see it all coming together. Fresh batch of cookies out of the oven and look at that forge finish. We're going to get this on the grinder now, sand it in to a satin. So let's go ahead now, get this back on the grinder. Now with our blade heat treated and brought up to a satin finish, we've got to start assembling the handle. So what I'm going to do is rough down a lot of the bulk on the guard and the pommel that I've already created. 
I'm just roughing them down to size and then I'll grind them in now get them to the nice shape get those aesthetic lines that I want we'll take those to a final finish and a polish before we use the leather stack because the way you you assemble these knives is a little bit different than you would like a micarta where you do the bulk of the work after We cut threads on an eighth inch dowel at the end of our knife tank. We then drilled out a piece of thick brass, tapped some threads into that piece, and then on our vertical mill, we set it up like a lathe and milled a round nut to hold the pommel on. Now there is no way to actually tighten this nut down. We don't have the room there to put like um, hexagonal facets on this nut. So I'm gonna use the traditional technique how you would approach something like this and we'll mill two notches into the knot and then we have to design a custom tool a special tool to mate with this to allow us to tension this knot at the end of our leather stacked handle i'll use a scrap piece of 01 tool steel for this process that way it's nice and solid we can give it a real quick heat treat and it'll just be a perfect perfect option here And there it is, nice and simple, and it's time to start putting together that leather stacked handle. I like gluing each piece of leather to the next one. I know manufacturers don't always do this, but I think it gives a much tighter fit over time. You can see I'm just squeezing each one over the tang. It just barely fits, very snug, kind of squeaks and whistles its way on there. And we'll just build that up until we have the right amount of shoulder exposed to add our pommel. Now in this case here, we can actually thread that nut on and use this as a compression device until you see it squeezing out that leather glue there. I'm just giving it a snug down on the threads. This is a brass nut. You're not going to want to crank this down, but gives us just a beautiful compression fit as you can see here. A very satisfying part of the process of that is cutting down and shaping the leather stack handle. Now I'll give you a tip. You do need razor sharp tools to shape leather like this because it's soft and pliable. So your utility knife blade like this needs to be brand new. When you take it over to the grinder, you need brand new fresh belts or you will just, just burn the leather and spoil your handle. It won't be a fun process at all. Let's get close to grandpa's dye color here. I believe this will be close, quite dark. Clean it off the brass right away just in case I don't want to risk any staining. Oh yeah, and that's the right color too. Whew. Kind of like a mahogany. Mm, 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 mm. The very last stage, I'm flushing off the end of that steel dowel with the brass and then I'm clamping that brass nut in a drill in order to polish it and I find a drill like this works as an awesome small device holder like you've got this little mini vise there that you can use to clamp in little parts for polishing and things I use it often and, and it's just perfect for the case of this little uh, this little brass nut here
From brutal offshore drilling platforms, all the way to the homeowner and hobbyist, Lincoln Electric's 125 years of experience provides the quality you need to get the job done right. The Newfoundland Hobbyist is sponsored by Lincoln Electric. setup that I'm using, the, the pancake style design, the strap retention you can see here are all brought over from that original design. And now on to stitching. And boy, I really don't stitch many sheaths anymore. My beautiful wife has taken over that job. It's been a big help. I just kind of deliver her batches of leather work. And she stitches them up when she's reading or, or watching a little TV at the end of the night or something like that in bed. And uh, they just come back to me all finished. And she does just a beautiful job, just as good or better as what I would do. And it frees up more time for me to, to do the knife work and the dirtier work. So it's just lovely partnership. Now I'm going to put it on the Kuramaku Blue Black 340 grit ceramic stone. Have a look here at the thickness of the blade. So that's the thick actual thickness of the blade here. And that's no edge. This knife has never been sharpened. No edge established. So I get to pick the angle. I get to do it all here. 
these Kuramakus or this stone is supposed to be a splash and go, but I find it's a bit too thirsty for that. Century Welding is an online Canadian outlet for premier welding and cutting machines, equipment, and related accessories and replacement parts. Shop for your welding machines and accessories, consumables, and even your safety apparel. The Newfoundland Hobbyist is sponsored by Century Welding. Now I'll move to the single cutting strokes like this. Start lightening up my pressure slightly. Honestly guys, I'm not a big a big believer in getting bogged down in the technicals. I am not a guided sharpening system. You're not going to hold your angle perfectly. I have, uh, you know, sometimes I have guys tell me they, they're sending in their knife for sharpening. They want it sharpened at 21 degrees. I don't hold 21 degrees. I hold a knife to about what it should be for the thickness of steel, the type of steel. You kind of get a knack for it, but I don't get bogged down in this. A lot of that silliness like some people get carried away with. Because in most cases, it's all meaningless. You spend, uh, invest an hour, hour and a half, getting your hunting knife just absolutely that exact 19.5 degrees and polished to 6,000 strapped. Then you get to a moose and you make your first four or five cuts and that edge is <laughs> dwindling away. Your work has been undone. Then the first thing you got to do is grab a ceramic hone or a little field stone. That's maybe 800 grit. And tear off all the hour and a half of work you wasted very light here now but let me know what you think of that concept that's my uh, my belief my standard very light pressure now let's check our edge finish up with a clean stone nice light cutting stroke passes we'll just do a few maybe 10 per side just an estimate I always give. Again, I don't get bogged down in counting strokes and all this stuff. It's just not that important. And I say that in almost every video to try to take off the intimidation for you guys. To say that you don't need to be intimidated. You don't need the stars to align. You just need to remove steel until you create an inch. There are kind of more refined ways to do that, and with experience, you can get a little better. You get faster at it. You produce better results. You produce an edge that lasts a little longer. But you're always doing just the the same kind of thing. You're removing steel, create a good edge. I'm gonna call that off right there. Metalwork, machining, leather crafting, stone sharpening—all beautiful and fantastic hobbies by themselves brought together to make a single product. Thank you for watching this episode. I really hope you learned something, and I hope you're taking those steps to dive into new opportunities for growth. Thank you to my sponsors for help making this show possible. And as always, make sure you tune in next week to the Newfoundland Hobbyist.